Hi, ActiveHistory.ca is happy to present a recording of historian Susanna Miranda's talk, Keeping the City Clean, Portuguese Women in Toronto's Cleaning Industry, 1970-1990. Her talk is part of the History Matters Lecture Series sponsored by the Toronto Public Library. Please check back on ActiveHistory.ca in the near future for recordings of subsequent talks from the History Matters Lecture Series. Uh, thank you, and thank you to Miriam for inviting me to participate in this lecture series, uh, to the Gladstone Library for hosting, and to you for being here. Uh, just let me tell you a bit about myself. As Miriam said, I just graduated with a PhD in history from York University. Uh, I'm Portuguese Canadian myself, and actually grew up about a block away from here, and um, got my first library card at this uh, very branch. Uh, well, uh, so, why this topic? So, many of the um, Women in my family and friends' families were cleaners, and I was interested in their work uh, and wanted to tell their stories and give them credit for the hard work that they did in supporting their families. Uh, my thesis was on both building cleaning and domestic cleaning, house cleaning. I'm going to focus um, on building cleaning tonight uh, in the interest of a coherent talk. And what I'm going to do is tell you four different stories that are examples of some of the experiences and activism of Portuguese women in the janitorial industry. This, so this material comes straight from my dissertation research, which included oral interviews with many Portuguese women, and some of whom I will identify tonight. So I think Southern European women, including uh, Portuguese, are often perceived as more backward or passive than Canadian-born women uh, due to their history of living in a right-wing dictatorship, uh, their conservative Catholic religion, and what is gen generally perceived as a patriarchal culture. However, Portuguese women were behind much of the militancy in the cleaning industry from the earliest years, as I will discuss. So these women did not come to Canada with the history of union activism, as under the dictatorship of Antonio Salazar, uh, free trade unions were prohibited and worker militancy was prohibited. Uh, but Portuguese women became active uh, in workplace activism for multiple reasons here in Canada. Uh, they desired respect and dignity as female ethnic workers, which meant safe working conditions and to be treated fairly by employers and management. And as wives and mothers, they also wanted decent wages so they could more adequately support their families. Uh, many of the women in the industry uh, were from the, are from the Portuguese islands of Azores, and, and certainly the majority of Portuguese immigrants in Canada do come from the Azores, about 65%. Um, so that, that reflects that. Um, and Azorian women themselves, I think, are often perceived as even more conservative than their uh, con uh, counterparts on the mainland of Portugal, um, a result of some discriminatory attitudes that position the, the Azores as a more backward or closed society. However, uh, it was these women who were behind much of the militancy in the cleaning industry, uh, not totally, but certainly a big part. So this is the Toronto skyline in the mid-70s. Uh, and let me, let me just start by providing you with a bit of context on the cleaning industry and Portuguese women's place within it. So in the 1960s and 1970s, Portuguese immigrants became a main labor force in the expanding janitorial industry. And the Canadian state and economy expanded considerably in the period after the Second World War. And um, almost all these office buildings were built in the 60s and 70s, which included... Uh, the new Queen's Park complex, four office towers built in 1965 that occupied close to two downtown city blocks, the new Toronto Dominion Tower, the Black Building, uh, at 56 stories, became in 1967 the tallest building in Toronto. First Canadian place, uh, the tallest white one there, was built in 1975 and is still the tallest building in Toronto at 72 stories. So as one of the newer, larger working class groups, the Portuguese became concentrated in this rapidly expanding sector by the late 60s. So lots of jobs were being opened up at the same time that Portuguese women were coming. Uh, family and ethnic connections increased the number of Portuguese uh, cleaning in these buildings. Um, and then employers also established networks within the Portuguese community, and particularly through the use of Portuguese supervisors. So one of the reasons Portuguese women chose this job was because you didn't need uh, a lot of English to do it or, or a high education. And, and certainly most Portuguese immigrants came to Canada 
with a grade four education, and that was because education was extremely restricted under Salazar's regime. But building cleaning at night offered some advantages as well, particularly for child care. When women left for work in the evening, husbands would come home around the same time and feed and put children to bed. And this allowed some women to be at home with their kids during the day. For others, it meant that they could actually do other work during the day, clean houses or clean hotels, so that they were doing more than one job at the same time. So the building cleaning industry has some unique characteristics. Building cleaners were and are mostly contract workers. And what this means is that building owners hire a cleaning contractor that hires cleaners rather than the building owner hiring cleaners themselves. And this cuts costs since contract cleaners are paid much lower wages than in-house staff. But the catch is, under the Ontario Labor Relations Act, cleaners and other workers employed through contractors receive little job, wage, or union protection. They don't have what's called successor rights. So what this means is when a new contractor is hired by the people that own the building, they don't have to recognize existing wage rates or benefits or even the union. You can start from scratch all over again. So when cleaners do organize, oftentimes the contract is cut in response. A new contractor is brought in so that the union can be taken out. So this makes unionization in the sector very difficult. Furthermore, the majority of building cleaners, at least 80%, are women. And they are categorized as light-duty cleaners as compared to men who are heavy-duty cleaners and who are paid a higher wage. So this is an industry where the gender division of labor and wages has persisted. And most of the workforce is female precisely because they are cheaper labor. And wages in the industry have historically hovered around minimum wage since the high competition for contracts acts as a downward pressure on wages. And it is also physically difficult work, demanding work, and relationships with supervisors, many of whom are Portuguese as well, are often tense. So the first case of activism I'll look at occurred at the Toronto Dominion Towers where workers were members of the Service Employees International Union. This union was an American or is an American-based union and was actually the only union organizing cleaners in Canada from the 1940s up into the 1970s when more Canadian progressive unions emerged in the industry. And the workforce at the TD Towers was overwhelmingly made up of Portuguese immigrants right from its opening in 1967. Union records show that by 1972, 250 of the 275 cleaners in the building were Portuguese. In 1974, Portuguese women held a wildcat strike. And this is an illegal strike because it occurs while the collective agreement is in place. Workers can only legally strike when they're bargaining for a new contract. And this was one of the first cases of activism among Portuguese women that I found in the public record. So modern building cleaning, the contractor, employed over 200 women to clean the offices from 5.30 to 10.30 at night, Monday to Friday. In May of that year, the general manager ordered the women to reuse plastic garbage bags. And the women didn't want to because they smelled. It made them ill. Some of them were throwing up and so on. They contacted their union representative who called the Department of Public Health who ruled that the plastic garbage bags could only be reused if they contained no organic waste, which is waste that can't decompose. But modern building cleaning, despite this, continued to pressure the women to reuse dirty garbage bags. And so the women decided to strike. Some of the women called Dan Heap, who was an NDP politician who lived in a Portuguese neighborhood and had a large Portuguese constituency. And he was known to some of the women through the neighborhood. And he noted in his records, When I arrived, I found the general manager flanked by security guards and two Metro police trying through interpreters to force 100 angry women 
mostly speaking only Portuguese, to use recycled garbage bags. Uh, Isalina Zvedu, who was a union steward, took a leadership role as she could speak some English. The employer had ordered the police to take her out of the building, but they asked her instead why she would not work, and she tried to explain to them that the bags were making the women sick. They then asked for a meeting, the police asked for a meeting with the employer, the union, and Dan Heap, and Idolina recounted to me their heart filled with happiness as it looked like the women might actually be heard. After four hours, their manager finally gave up and promised new bags. In an interview uh, I did with Isolina, she explained that the employer thought he could get away with exploiting the women because they could not speak English and thus could not defend themselves. But this episode <coughs> is an example of the ability of Portuguese immigrant women to fight quite early on for their rights in the workplace. Indeed, the fact that the workplace was mostly Portuguese allowed for a greater degree of militancy because it's much easier to come together as a group when you can all speak the same language. Um, the women used the union to meet their needs, and they also called upon a politician, which is, are examples of some of their cleverness in finding allies to help them with workplace issues. And this is a theme that runs through Portuguese women's activism. Although they had few English skills and lack of knowledge of how to formally fight for their rights, they were clever in finding people who could help them. And the second case I will describe also illustrates this. Oh, uh, these are uh, clean. This isn't from the strike. I don't have pictures from the from the Wildcat strike. But these are cleaners at the TV center uh, negotiating a new contract a couple years later. And this is my Queens Park. Uh, so in early 1975, a group of female Portuguese cleaners at the Queen's Park complex decided to unionize. They worked for Modern Building Cleaning as well, the same contractors at the TD Towers. They wanted higher wages and were also unhappy that heavy cleaning jobs were given to men only and had other grievances such as management firing workers without cause. They, de they de thus decided that the only way that they would be able to improve their wages and working conditions was to form a union, although none of them had had any experience with unions in the past. But they were aware that some Portuguese cleaners were in unions, such as at the TV Towers, and also many of their husbands were in construction unions, and they told them that unions were good for workers. Um, the women at, So they took on this task of unionizing on their own, a difficult and even unusual thing for women with little English skills or union experience. When a modern building official heard of the movement to unionize, he called one of the leaders, Leopoldina Pimentel, uh, to his office and fired her. And she's the, uh, the older lady there on the, um, on the left. Uh, two male Portuguese-speaking company representatives went to her home the next day, asking her for the list of names of those interested in forming a union. But Leopoldina had already destroyed the evidence and would not give them any names. At the workplace the next day, employers pressured cleaners to sign another paper indicating that they did not want to join a union. Knowing that they would be fired if they did not do so, uh, most of the women signed. However, the ones who refused were fired as well. But the leaders of the unionization drive then went from home to home explaining their position and collecting signatures from the cleaners who wanted to join. And Modern Building responded with a campaign of intimidation, including nighttime visits to the women's homes, speed ups, transfers, threats on the job, and the firing of more women. But despite this, in April 1975, the Service Employees International Union, Local 204, was certified as the bargaining agent for the workers in the, comp in the complex. And this is the women at a union meeting right across the street from uh, one of the government buildings, actually my high school cafeteria, <laughs> so, which is really weird. Um, 1975, yeah. Bargaining uh, between the union and modern building then began in July of the same year, and the female cleaners wanted higher wages. However, the contractor argued that it couldn't increase wages 
because it had a set contract price from the Ontario government, and they can only pay higher wages if the government agreed to pay higher for their contract. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and so what Modern Building Cleaning did was cancel. They said, we're, you know, we're not doing this contract anymore, and all the women were fired. And uh, the Ontario government then uh, put the contract up for bidding. Uh, the government of Ontario actually refused to get involved in the issue, uh, despite the fact that they ultimately had the power to keep the cleaners jobs by hiring the same contractor, even if it was at a higher contract price, to accommodate higher wages. Uh, this event was the beginning of a larger awareness in the city of the experiences of building cleaners in Toronto, uh, partly because the cleaners sought out help in order to keep their jobs. And much of this help came from community workers associated with St. Christopher House. Now, I'll just tell you a little bit about St. Christopher House before I tell you what happened with the fire cleaners. Um, St. Christopher House, uh, located in downtown West Toronto, where many Portuguese lived, had been serving the Portuguese since the 1950s when they arrived through uh, men's clubs, women's clubs, uh, nurse daycares, um, English classes, interpreter programs, and so on. However, by the early 1970s, progressive community work with immigrants was on the rise, replacing an older model of conservative immigrant reception work focused on assimilation. This more progressive community work reflected many of the social and political changes of the time, including women's rights, labor rights, and more tolerance for cultural and racial diversity. And all of this affected the work that St. Christopher House was doing with the Portuguese. Community workers there were not only influenced by secular uh, rights, but a religious one as well, and were most influenced by Brazilian Paulo Freire's ideas. And Freire began to develop literacy programs for the poor in Brazil and to embrace liberation theology by the 1960s. This is a lot of time, a time of a lot of change for uh, Christian religion, uh, such as Vatican II and so on. And Frere advocated um, justice, equality, and consciousness raising of the working classes through literacy education. And so the community workers were highly influenced by this, what was going on within left-wing Christianity. And so they started progressive uh, programs with the Portuguese to, to get them to think about their rights as workers and as immigrants and so on. And the first program was called the Portuguese West of Bathurst Program which was started in 1974. And what community workers did was they went out into the community, they knocked on doors, they talked to people, found out what their most pressing needs were, and then organized them into groups to kind of deal with a lot of these problems. Um, uh, many of the Queen's Park cleaners had already been going to St. Christopher House um, and talking with them about their work. So when they were fired, they asked these community workers for help. And a, another new program was born at St. Christopher House called Cleaners Action. And I'll discuss Cleaners Action a bit more in a moment. Um, I'll just finish uh, the story. And here you have the Queen's Park Cleaners and uh, one of the St. Chris workers right there, Sydney Pratt. So the St. Christopher House workers acted as advisors and interpreters, and importantly, they contacted the press about the women's stories. So the story received much press in the English language newspapers, such as the Toronto Star and the Globe and Mail, and they even made it on TV. They were interviewed, and they were on the news, some of the women. This woman was actually cleaning, a Portuguese woman. Um, I don't have the actual footage, but I have a picture <laughs> of the TV. Um, and some of the stories of these women came out uh, in the news. And one thing to emerge was that the women's wages were really important to the financial survival of the family. They weren't just, you know, sup you know, just, uh, you know, a bit of extra money. Um, many had husbands in construction who might not be employed during the winter, or worse, were injured. And many of the women. Uh, cleaned hotels or houses during the day and cleaned buildings at night to make more money for the family. Besides contacting newspapers, the cleaner supporters also made a decision to hold press conferences. And they did so um, 
particularly to, to pressure the government of Ontario to get involved in the issue, as the story had the potential to make bad press for the government, uh, since, the, of course, the cleaners clean government buildings, right? So they, they, they sought to embarrass the government into um, helping the women keep their jobs. Uh, even though they were not legally the employers, the contractor were. But often um, the pressure on the contractor is really ineffective because even if they do agree to, to higher wages or even recognizing the union, they're so easily replaced um, that uh, you have to really put employer on the owner of the building to get involved. The government, however, awarded the contract to a new cleaning company, Consolidated Maintenance Services an American-based company whose bid was $70,000 lower than that of Modern Building Cleaning. The women then decided to go speak to the deputy minister to ask for his help in getting their jobs back, and not only was it a new experience for them to speak to a high-level government official, but they met with him in the very offices that they cleaned at night. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I thought that was interesting. Uh, when he offered no help, they went to Dan, Dan Heath's house again, uh, as they knew he had helped the women at TD a couple years previously, and he agreed to rally NDP members to the cause. And a second press conference was held, um, and it was held in the Queen's Park Gallery, and because of all the press that the story was generating, uh, lots of new groups got involved, including women's groups, other unions, Ontario Federation of Labour, and City Hall. And at the press conference, Portuguese women continued to explain the difficulties of their working lives and asked the government to help. With their children there because they could not afford babysitters, the women crowded into the room where the press conference was held. One cleaner explained that she had seven children, her husband made a poor salary, and she had to work to feed them. Furthermore, most of the women had husbands in the construction industry who would soon be out of work for much of the winter. This was happening in the fall. Uh, journalists were actually really surprised that the women were doing this and wanted to know what their husbands thought about it. Um, and in asking these questions, I think they were drawing on stereotypes of Portuguese women as submissive wives and workers. The cleaners refused to talk about their husbands and would only talk about their work. Um, the ministry uh, refused to change the contract bidding procedure um, because it made good business sense. However, the increasing public pressure on the government did force them to act. Uh, in a response that would become a long-standing pattern in the cleaning industry, they announced that they would speak to a representative of Consolidated and ask them to hire the cleaners. And the cleaners accepted the new, uh, new jobs with this new contractor, which actually didn't give them that, that much more um, in wages than, than what they had before. However, the Ontario government agreed to implement regulations that would require firms receiving government contracts for cleaning, maintenance, and security to pay the existing negotiated wage rates and benefits. So what happens is even if you get a new contractor, the government said they had to recognize the existing negotiated wage rates, the union, seniority, uh, benefits uh, each time. So even if the employer changed, the conditions of work wouldn't change. And what this was was uh, informal successor rights for cleaners in government buildings. Um, and they had this from 1975 until uh, 1995 when Mike Harris decided this wasn't good policy and he got rid of it. Um, but they had it for 20 years. Um, but the fact that it was the government made a difference because they care what the public thinks about their labor practices, right? Um, but private companies had much more power uh, over how they treated their workers. And so uh, from this episode on, the struggle for legal successor rights um, became a goal of the cleaners movement. And I'll mention that again in a moment. So before I move on to my third story, let me tell you a bit more about cleaners action. So I mentioned how the Portuguese West of Bathurst project was started at St. Christopher House in 1974. And in response to their clients' biggest problems, uh, other programs were created, such as new ESL curriculum based on teaching, workers, uh, teaching immigrants about their rights in Canada, 
a workplace ESL program stemmed from this in 1975, and then Cleaners Action. Sidney Pratt, an American community worker at St. Christopher House, who I showed you earlier, was influenced by international movements to organize cleaners. And the name Cleaners Action came from a similar um, program in London, England at the same time. And Cleaners Action started by getting small groups of women who lived close to one another to meet, discuss their needs, give each other support, uh, talk about other working conditions, and develop a larger political consciousness. Uh, they also helped the women examine union contracts, understand them, and prepare them to negotiate with unions. So this is a, a newsletter. Cleaners Action started a newsletter, and they ran workshops uh, and so on to um, uh, talk to women about their rights, uh, employment standards, and so on. And through the newsletter, St. Christopher House was able to reach a larger number of cleaners than just those who attended formal workshops. So like 50 women might come to a workshop, but they take a bunch of newsletters and distribute them in the buildings. So hundreds of newsletters were being given out uh, in the buildings. And again, this was also modeled on, on um, what they were doing in London, England at the same time, where the cleaner's voice was distributed to thousands of cleaners uh, in the 70s. The first issue featured a new logo that would be used through the 1980s uh, to identify activism around cleaners' issues. The first issue also contained an interview with Leopoldina Pimentel there on the right. This is, um, sorry, on the left. This is uh, Idolina Azevedo, who I've also mentioned at a, at a cleaners' action meeting. Um, as Pimentel stated, in the first issue of the newsletter they interviewed her for, she said, before we had the union, we didn't have any benefits. Now we have 12 days of holidays, whereas before we had only three. And if the boss that picks on someone and wants to fire them, he can't do that. Now we have the union, and the union doesn't let that happen. While cleaners' actions stress the benefits of unionizing, they were also critical of union practices. For example, they put pressure on unions to translate union contracts into Portuguese and to hire union officers that spoke Portuguese. Um, so overall, Cleaners Action was very important in making sure that cleaners knew what was going on in the industry, they knew about unions, and that they could have somewhere to go if they were having problems. Uh, so I'll, I'll get to my third story about Portuguese women. This one took place in 1977, and Cleaners Action staff were also involved in this one. Uh, Metro Police Headquarters um, in 1977 was contracting out its cleaning. While two day cleaners were hired directly by the city, night cleaning was contracted out, and the ten contract janitors, seven women and three men, were all Portuguese. They earned minimum wage, they also had no union and few benefits and no grievance procedure to protect them. In contrast, the two day cleaners who were hired directly by the city were members of QB, earned much better wages, and had benefits and job protection. Once again, the cleaners led this fight. So Sidney Pratt had been going door to door in the Portuguese community to let people know of the services available to the Portuguese at St. Christopher House. And she knocked on one woman's door, Arminda, who complained to Pratt that her wages were too low considering she had nine children and her husband also made a low salary as a cleaner at Eaton's. However, Arminda couldn't speak English and didn't know how to make a formal complaint. So Sydney offered her support. And again, she contacted Dan Heath and he agreed to help. And Arminda and the cleaners acted despite, despite knowing that they would probably or might lose their jobs by complaining. In fact, Amina's family told her not to pursue this and said, you're just going to lose your job. And she said, if I lose my job, I'll just go and find another. If she, if she was committed to doing this. And as she stated in the present day when I interviewed her, <coughs> we wanted our rights uh, because others had them and we didn't. I have some pictures of Amina, but they're all frozen now, unfortunately. Uh, so Dan Heath asked Metro Council executive to stop contract cleaning and hire the cleaners directly. However, council wouldn't, wouldn't go for this. 
Sidney and the Cleaners then met with the executive committee of Metro Council to make their case. And I think this episode is very significant because we have a so-called ordinary working class Portuguese immigrant woman going to City Hall and speaking personally with city politicians. And Amina was not afraid to do so. She made a statement to the committee through an interpreter. Because we have no unions, such as public employees have a QP, we have very little security. Some of us have been fired after being away sick. Others have been threatened with being fired if they didn't come back to work the third day after reporting they were sick. This happened to me. We have no rights and benefits like those of other cleaners. But the city still voted to continue contract cleaning. However, due to ongoing pressure from Dan Heap, when the new police headquarters opened in 1998, cleaners transferred there, including Arminda, became municipal employees and member of the union. As such, the determination and action of these cleaners in these early years did have some impact later on. As our lawyer noted, the cleaners had done much of the work themselves, only requesting assistance from Sydney. And I think it's important to stress that these women were not being used by English-speaking activists to further a cause, but it was they themselves who sought out help for the issues that they were concerned about. Okay, this is a cleaner's action meeting. I like this picture because this woman seems so... Something about her seems so tough. This is a picture of... I guess you can't see it that well with the light. A cleaner's action meeting. This is... That's what we did there at City Hall with some of the other cleaners in that stand meet when they went down to City Hall to make their case. And that could mean that talking, doing her... giving her statement at City Hall. So let me move on to a fourth story, one which received much press in the English-language newspapers. In 1979, the Canadian Food and Associated Services Union organized the mostly Portuguese building cleaners at First Canadian Place. And this is a union meeting or a meeting early on in the 70s, 1979, when they were talking about bringing in a union. As at Queen's Park a few years previous, it was Portuguese immigrant women who were the overwhelming majority at this workplace who led the campaign for unionization. A Portuguese cleaner arrived at the union office one afternoon and asked Wendy Eiler, an organizer for the union, to visit her workplace, telling her that the cleaners there wanted to unionize. Wendy arrived with union cards one night as the women... one night, and she was able to sign almost all the workers at that time, which she stressed to me in a later interview was extremely rare for a union to encounter. The women had gathered outside of the building just before their shift was to start. Security guards and supervisors watched from inside the building, not knowing what was going on. When the women signed the union cards, they marched proudly into the building, despite threats from supervisors that they would be fired for doing this. That's another union meeting there. Much as at Queen's Park, it was relations with management that made the women unionize. Supervisors fired women for no reason, and one cleaner who I spoke to, Lucia, argued that it just wasn't fair that women were fired when they were just trying to make a decent living for their families. And Lucia and others thought the union could help defend their rights. And certainly the women also had financial reasons to unionize and wanted higher wages. Of the 120 eligible cleaners, 96 had signed union cards, well above the 55% that is required legally for union certification. And the union was certified in October 1979. Here you have a woman voting on a contract, and a large group of votes. I like this one. In 1984, the union, which was now called the Food and Service Workers of Canada, was bargaining for the third time of federated building maintenance. Female cleaners earned $5.83 an hour, and men $6.97, and they wanted a wage increase of $0.50 an hour. On June 3rd, the union local voted to reject a wage increase of $0.30 an hour, and the cleaners voted 96% in favor of a strike. And the next day, 250 cleaners, 90% of whom were women and Portuguese, went on strike. But 
the contractor, Federated Building, argued that since Olympia and York, Olympia and York owned First Canadian Place, and Olympia and York was owned by the Reichman brothers at the time, who were worth billions of dollars, they wouldn't pay higher for the cleaning contract. And so Federated threatened the women, said, if you continue with this, uh, we're just going to lose the contract and you're all going to be out of work. Uh, but the cleaners knew that this uh, strike action could result in the loss of the contract, but they were determined to act anyway. Most of the cleaners were mainly in their 30s and 40s and were married with young children. Uh, their activism was rooted in their responsibilities to their families. Uh, cleaners like Margarita supported three small children because her injured husband had not worked for nearly four years. Also, the cleaners were aware of their vulnerable position as immigrants in the Canadian economy. In their coverage of the strike, Toronto journalists noted the sense of disappointment of women who came to Canada with visions of a better life and were prepared to work hard for it. Emilia, who was president of the local at the time, uh, stated in a letter to the owners of the building, Surely you can understand our situation. We are immigrants to this country. We take pride in our work and we work hard. We are trying to make a better life for our families. Children became very much part of the strike. And his t-shirt says he's a terrific kid. The press noted that children played around the buildings. And, uh, quote, on most evenings, children strut along the sidewalk, carrying signs, slurping popsicles, shouting through a megaphone, or generally annoying their mothers. The children were important allies, actually, to their mothers during the strike, letting them know when strike breakers were sneaking into the building and shouting at them. Husbands also joined the picket line, and their experience with construction unions Led to, the support, uh, led to their support for their wife's activism. The picket line also had a distinctly Portuguese flavor to it. It was sometimes reinforced with a Portuguese band. The women sang Portuguese songs, some of them religious, and uh, certainly their religious faith came out in the press coverage. As one striker told a reporter, Jesus gives me strength to continue fighting. They also sang and danced a wedding favorite, Pasadena de Bailar, the bird dance, if anyone knows that from, yeah. <laughs> and Lucia um, it described the tenants from the building would come to watch the women sing and dance, and often the cleaners would make these people laugh, and so at times the strike was, act was actually some fun. The cleaners also chanted, um, which means the people united will never be defeated. This was originally a slogan of Chilean resistance against the Pinochet dictatorship, uh, and it also became central to the Portuguese Revolution in 1974. So I think there were symbolic links then between the struggle for democracy in Portugal and women's struggle for justice in their new home. But the picketing was challenging as well, and particularly because there were 14 entrances into the building, um, and some of them underground, and these had to all be blocked. And the picket line became tense from the start. On the second day of the strike, one of the strikers was arrested as she tried to block the entry of a delivery truck. Two husbands were also arrested and charged with assaulting a police officer when they got involved. Things got worse when police began helping scabs cross the picket line and scabs are people who are hired to replace the cleaners, to do the cleaners' work while the cleaners are on strike. And the cleaners were absolutely furious. They shouted at strike breakers who arrived in front of the building and attempted to block underground tunnels leading into the building. And shouting included lots of swearing in Portuguese, which I won't repeat here for you, by the women. And one cleaner was arrested for chasing and hitting a male supervisor confederated with her umbrella. <laughs> in one episode, the cleaners crowded into the lobby of First Canadian Place, where they picketed and shouted. A representative of the owners of the building urged them to move outside, since they were trespassing. But they refused to leave, and the police were brought in to drag them out. The women shouted in Portuguese as they saw those arrested being led to the police van, and one of these was Lucia, and it took six uniformed officers to get her into the police van. 
and that's what you see there, being dragged away. And this, was a, this is from the Toronto Star. Uh, so overall, Portuguese women were actually very physical on the picket line, which is one of the things I was most surprised about when I did my research. Uh, so they certainly weren't passive at all. Uh, ten workers who had been on strike crossed the picket line to return to work. About ten, uh, uh, I also came across uh, twelve in another document. However, I think the fact that it was only ten out of over 200 women is an example of the strong support for the strike for the women, even though it was very financially difficult. They were on strike for six weeks, and strike pay is very low. So it, it was difficult, but many did not cross the line. Uh, the strike received a lot of press in the Toronto Star and Globe and Mail, and I certainly found lots and lots of articles about it. And I think partly it was because um, journalists were actually surprised that these immigrant women were actually being so aggressive. Uh, and I think uh, they were considered, um, one reporter called them, an, an unlikely collection of union militants. Uh, so I think there was some, you know, they didn't quite understand what was going on. Uh, they also got attention, I think, because they worked at night. Not too many people saw them. All of a sudden, they're out of their cleaning uniforms. They're out in the middle of the day on Bay Street, right? <laughs> this is uh, the, the heart of Canada's most wealthy financial district, right? And, and they're publicly they're being very public and outspoken about uh, their working conditions right on Bay Street. The cleaners, again, uh, start to get a lot of support from the larger labor movement, women's groups, politicians. Uh, Bob Bray joined the women on the picket line. Here's Dan Heath again. He's, he's around for a long time. Uh, other cleaners from other buildings also joined, including those from the Toronto Dominion Centre. And all of this public pressure uh, forced um, Federated, the contractor, and Olympia New York, the owners of the building, to settle the strike. There was a lot of pressure on them. This is from the Toronto Star as well. After six weeks, the cleaners accepted Federated's new offer. It provided them with a 35 cent hourly increase in the first year and a further 25 cent increase in the second year of the agreement. When the contract was accepted, Amelia, the president of the local, shouted into a megaphone, We have proven to everyone that we have the courage. We proved to Canada and to Olympia New York, owners of the building, that we are immigrants and we are women, but we can fight. The cleaners celebrated their win in Portuguese ways. They put on a celebratory party in a Portuguese hall, Casa de Benfica. For those of you who don't know, Benfica is a popular Portuguese soccer team. Um, the party was for the families of the strikers and union supporters, and 400 people attended. The cleaners cooked the five-course meal themselves and did all the cleanup. Many of them, dressed in their nicest dresses with aprons over top, ran back and forth between the kitchen where they prepared the meal, the microphone where they gave speeches, and the dance floor. The cleaners, their families, and supporters danced until 3 a.m. to the music of Nazareth Raya Disc Jockey. By waging the strike, the women asserted their right to respect and dignity in the workplace and a decent standard of living. They also accomplished something think big by winning a strike against a major corporation and showed that they could be strong and active union members. And important too was the cleaner's own sense of pride in having taken part in the strike. And as Lucia told me, in the present, the women still talk about the strike to this day. So Portuguese women continued to be involved in workplace activism through the 1980s and 1990s and even had legal successor rights for a short time uh, when Bob Bray came into power in Ontario. He, um, they had successor rights from 1993, and, and Mike Harris got rid of them again in 1995, so they had them for about two years. Now many Portuguese cleaners are retiring, and other immigrant groups are replacing them in the industry. But I think it is important to understand the important place that Portuguese women held in the industry and how they fought hard, oftentimes with community workers and unions, to change wages and conditions in the sector. And further, I think we still hold notions of Portuguese women as struggling in their new home, as maybe passive and as victims, 
but we need to rethink this view and take into account their struggle for dignity and justice in Canada. Despite their lack of English skills and no formal political union uh, or union background, <coughs> these women were able to assert their rights in Canada by finding allies, calling on politicians, and joining unions and striking. And I'll leave you with one quotation that I liked very much from my PhD interviews, and it was with a, a unionist, a Canadian-born unionist, not Portuguese, and she said to me, these were feisty, hard-headed women, and quite sophisticated in their political strategies. They had to be, given the rough and tumble of the industry they worked in. Many people foolishly underestimated them. Thank you. You've been listening to a recording of Susanna Miranda's talk, Keeping the City Clean, Portuguese Women in Toronto's Cleaning Industry, 1970-1990. to Please check back on activehistory.ca in the near future for recordings of subsequent talks from the History Matters Lecture Series.